POV, it's 1996, and you are voting for the AL MVP. Bill Clinton is president, and everyone's doing the Macarena. Great time to be alive, except for you in this moment. See, this is an especially critical spot to be in, as not only are you voting for the MVP in the first full year since 1993, but the first full 162 game season in the newly established wildcard era. Seriously, this year is a turning point. Now in the grand scheme, even in the laurels of Major League Baseball, this vote is a very tiny gesture. That's what having canceled games due to a labor dispute will do, diminishing perspectives through recognition of fragility. Even then, the results of these awards have the potential to create debates for generations. Who can forget in 1962 when Maury Wills, with his 720 OPS, was somehow able to edge out his reciprocally named division rival, Willie Mays. Sure, Maury Wills led the league with 104 stolen bases, shattering the single season record for stolen bases this century, but he also got caught a league leading 13 times. But you're a smart voter. You don't get fooled by eye-popping stats even when they're unlike anything you've ever seen in your lifetime. You like to evaluate the field holistically. Taking a look at our candidates, we see Alex Rodriguez, who in his first full season just broke the record for extra base hits by someone 20 years old or younger. That may be a cool stat to bring up to the ladies, but you have to constantly remind yourself that you're a smart voter. Yes, you are. Don't get fooled by singular eye-popping stats. Plus, his value is diminished by the fact that he had tremendous lineup support from Ken Griffey Jr. And even then, they couldn't lead their Seattle Mariners to a playoff berth. I mean, come on. This is the novel wildcard era we're talking about. 28.6% of teams make it to the playoffs now. A relative cakewalk compared to yesteryear. And they couldn't lead their silly little team to October? After talking yourself down that proverbial cliff, you check out Albert Bell who was able to put together yet another monster season to lead his team to a first place finish. You're still trying to live down last year when he voted Mo Vaughn over him, despite the fact that Bell literally surpassed him in every consequential stat besides stolen bases. But Albert Bell has repeatedly insulted you, your peers, and your mom. Plus, he's a literal cheater. By voting for him, you're saying cheating is A-OK. -okay. And this is Major League Baseball a league that clearly defines and makes the effort to weed out cheaters. Maybe Kenny Lofton, the teller to Bell's pen, he also helped the Indians to a first place finish and was the spark plug for a power heavy offense. Nah, what about this Juan Gonzalez? Whoa. Quick disclaimer, I'll be talking a lot about war or wins above replacement in this video. If you're either a casual fan, just getting into the game, or, I don't know, have been living under a rock, war is an attempt to measure how many more wins a player provides to their team than a replacement player would. Who is this replacement player? I, I don't know. That's for, that's for your imagination to decide. But to make things a little bit easier, I was able to print out this picture of 2021 Jed Lowry as reference who in 138 games put up 0.1 war, or roughly replacement level. As much as I don't like using one stat to sum up a player's season, it is by far the most convenient way to quickly glance and assess one's value on the diamond. First things first, why was his war so low? Well, defense. By this year, Amazon was in its infancy, let alone hosting the systems where StatCast data would eventually reside. So we have to use old reliable, the eye test. And thanks to Champion Media for uploading bits of the 1996 LDS, a series where the Yankees barely squeaked out three games to advance past the Rangers. So let's take a look. The 0 1 to Fielder. Into right field, base hit. They're going to wave around Williams. Guns okay, that's not too bad. I mean, he looks shaky, but he fields that ball cleanly. Cheater swings on the 3 1 pitch, little flare and a shallow right. And Did did he just snow cone that catch? I mean, I'll just say from these few clips, it's clear he can't read a ball at a first grade level. I wish I had more film to look at, but you get what you get. I wanted to find just how absurd this vote was, so I came up with a metric called MVP War Shares to measure how much worse Gonzalez fared with the competition. MVP War Shares just how it sounds. Simply take the war of that year's MVP as a percentage of the total war of all players who got at least one vote. Is this a flawless method? No. 
but it'll give a general idea of just how the MVP stacked up with a direct competition. Here are the war shares for every MVP from 1981 to 1995. Generally, most MVPs stay well above the 4% threshold. The only ones who don't clear it I marked with an asterisk, because they all happen to be closers. And there's a reason for that. See, the save stat wasn't officially adopted until 1969, and it didn't become popular until the 1980s, when it became a cultural fad alongside other staples of the decade, such as the Breakfast Club, and doing copious amounts of cocaine while pushing an unsustainable economic system to its perceived limit. Generally though, as a non-reliever, you want to be clearing that 6% threshold to be crowned MVP. The lowest being Mo Vaughn, whose decision we'll touch upon later. Juan Gonzalez's MVP share, 3.2%, almost half of the average. Now what this chart doesn't show is Gonzalez's season in the context of his team. Out of all players on that Rangers squad, Gonzalez wasn't even their most productive. That would be Ken Hill, who, in his only full season in a Rangers uniform, would put up the 6th best ERA plus for a starter in franchise history with a 145 spot. A number that wouldn't be topped by a Rangers pitcher until CJ Wilson in 2011. Gonzalez wasn't even the second best player on his team. That would be future Hall of Famer Ivan Rodriguez, who he himself would win a disputed MVP award three years later. Surely Gonzalez was the third best player on his team, right? Right? Good to see you again, Rusty. Okay, he has to be the fourth best. There's no other way. All oh, Jiminy Snickets. According to B-War, Juan Gonzalez was the fifth most valuable player on his team, the year he won MVP for the league. Now look, an MVP not being the most valuable player for their own team is nothing new. It happens, and it's fine. History has always been written by those whose exploits far exaggerate the truth. In fact, since the modern era to 1996, I found what some may say is a concerning amount of MVPs who weren't even the most viable player on their team according to B-War. But to be the fifth best is absolutely confounding to a point where I still can't fully wrap my head around it. That's like Michael Brantley winning the 2019 MVP for the Houston Astros. Sure, a good player for a good team, but not MVP of the league. Now let's try and justify how this happened. For one, the run scoring environment at the time was crazy. As you can see, after hitting a snag in 92, runs per game shot up like Mia Wallace after a dose of adrenaline to the chest and hit an all-time high not seen since Lou Gehrig's second MVP. When the run environment is this crazy, it's hard to see the forest from the trees. In other words, when everyone's super, no one is. It should also be noted that the vote was close. Like, super close. Gonzalez edged out Alex Rodriguez in the voting by three points, equivalent to an eighth place vote. In fact, this was the closest finish for AL MVP since the modern age, and this remains the closest finish in the AL since. Still, 11 writers dropped their ballot off with Gonzalez's name at the top. There had to be a reason why voters chose him over the clearly superior seasons seen from Alex Rodriguez, Ken Griffey Jr., and Albert Bell, among others. Let's find reasons to dismiss the names I just listed. Both Rodriguez and Griffey had once-in-a-lifetime type seasons, and they both happened to have them for the same team on the same year. Just to put this into perspective, from 1947 to 1995, there were a total of 34 seasons in which a player had a war of 9.4 or above. We're talking a generation here, when a computer went from looking like this to this. And there were only 34 individual seasons of seeing a player amount to such great heights. It should go without saying, but none of those occasions occurred concurrently with a bench buddy. In fact, this was the first time this happened since, well, Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth put up monster seasons for a 1930s Yankee club that somehow failed to finish in first place. Now, due to financial constraints, there was no official MVP that year, but the Associated Press did select their own unofficial MVP, choosing Joe Cronin, despite putting up a transparently worse season, even by the standards of the time. Fast forward 64 years later, when these two behemoths followed a similar narrative. Now, the exploits of the lowly Mariners have been discussed to death by much more talented storytellers, but despite A-Rod and the kids' best efforts, the Mariners fell second in the AOS, behind the 
Now, as much as writers will tell you they base the award on individual merit nowadays, just like with the win stat when it comes to the Cy Young Award, voters have had to learn not to intertwine individual accomplishment with team efforts. You don't even have to go far back from here to see this archaic philosophy play out in real time. Take the final reliever to ever win MVP, Dennis Eckersley, who despite, well, being a reliever, won the award over Kirby Puckett in 1992, partially based on the fact that his athletics won the AL West with 96 victories, while Puckett's twins came up six games behind them. That sort of explains away those two. But what about Albert Bell? His team did make it to the playoffs on the back of another strong season from the Shreveport-born Beefcake. Well, Albert Bell is the exception to every rule. In fact, this wasn't even the most egregious MVP runner-up he's endured. That would be the year prior in which, despite the fact that he was the first and only player to ever hit 50 doubles and 50 homers, doing it in a shortened season might I add, fell just shy of Mo Vaughn, who put up a respectable, but in all measures objectively worse season than Bell. So what, did the voters just have it out for him? Well, yeah, because he was an asshole and a known cheater. See the corked bat incident. If you thought voters are spiteful against outspoken players now, well, just know nothing ever really changes. So with the obvious candidates willfully explained away, let's examine Gonzalez himself. What about his year jumps off the page the most to you? I'll give you a few seconds to decide. It's... it's the RBIs. Now yes, it is true Albert Bell drove in more runs, but one, he's Albert Bell, and two, Juan Gonzalez was able to drive in 144 runs in only 134 games. Now, besides asking ourselves if a player should be judged in the value he brought when he was on the field, assuming he at least played in a full season, or measured over the total value they brought over the course of 162 games, this is a really impressive stat. In fact, out of every player to knock in 100 or more runs from 1968 to 1996, Juan had the most RBI per game. Now this gets into our ultimate question, do RBIs matter? And my hotly debated answer is, yes, but with context. Now before I go on, I would like to warn my viewers that we are leaving the zone of objectivity and entering into a zone not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of bias. We are now entering the subjectivity zone. So RBIs are what I like to call an opportunity stat. An opportunity stat is any stat that is either partially or fully dependent on another outcome. So for example, a run is an opportunity stat, since in many cases, it requires a teammate to drive the player in. Now, a player is able to drive themselves in with a dinger, but consider this, that even in the homer-happy 1996 season, they only accounted for 35.2% of runs scored. A hit, on the other hand, is not an opportunity stat, since it isn't dependent on another outcome to occur besides getting up to the plate. So I'm going to compare RPIs to what I consider another opportunity stat. Stolen bases. <gasps> 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 That's ludicrous! You may be whispering to yourself or typing in the comments if you're feeling extra confident today. But think about it. A stolen base can only happen if a player reaches base. Sure, it's dependent on their own action, but it's still dependent on another event nonetheless. So how does 35 steals in a season sound? Pretty good. Now what if I told you the same player got caught stealing 29 times that year? That would be Harold Reynolds' 1988 season. Not really great if you ask me. Now how does 101 RBIs in a season sound? Pretty solid. But what if I told you the same player had a 399 slugging with men on? Hey, how are you doing there, Albert Pujols 2017? So RBIs still matter, but a few contextual stats need to be seen before determining their merit. Juan Gonzalez had a 963 OPS with runners on. Not bad. For reference, Mo Vaughn had a 11-10 OPS with runners on. Okay, but let's look at slugging with a runner on first. You know, how much are they smacking the ball when they gotta drive someone 270 feet home? Oh. Oh. 
So what have we learned from this? Well, personally, having over 25 baseball reference tabs open at once is neither good for my mental health or my CPU. But in reality, we have to understand that voting was different back then. The writers were slow to adopt sabermetrics and other empirical-based analysis. The run environment was reaching heights not seen since the Great Depression. Voters were swept up in the heights of power stats the same way they're swept up with saves when those were in vogue. Juan Gonzalez was a player whose flaws weren't flashy, but his strengths were. In hindsight, the vote has been highly criticized, and even at the time it didn't make much sense. It cost Ken Griffey Jr. what would have been his first career MVP. Granted, he won it the next year, but that would be his only MVP plaque. But you live and you learn. And the best way to learn and improve is by making mistakes. And I think the voters learned their lesson here. No. No. No, God, please, no. 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 You blew it up. No. Disappointed! Okay. There are simply no heads or tails to be made of this, but let's start with some positives. This was a slightly less heinous vote. You know that silly little MVP war share stat from earlier? Well, Gonzalez's 98 season was better in that category by roughly half a percentage. Okay, well, maybe the competition was thinned out and spread more evenly this year. The run environment was slightly lower, so maybe from an aesthetic level, Gonzalez's season stood head and shoulders above the rest. He won over career-defining seasons from Nomar, the captain, and A-Rod. Shortstops that are so iconic that I didn't even have to say their full name, and 98% of you immediately knew who I was talking about. This is, this is insane. This means that Juan Gonzalez, with a career 38.7 war, who lasted two years on the Hall of Fame ballot, albeit with steroid suspicions, joins a very exclusive list of players with two or more MVPs to their name. And this is an elite list. We're talking immortal greats like Ted Williams and Mickey C Ring. I've sorted them all by war per game just to get a fair assessment on each player, multiplying the number by a thousand to make it a little more palatable. Despite having some catching up to do in terms of hardware, Mike Trout leads the group by a lot, which is a stat that makes me happy. Most of them bunch up in the 30 to 40 range like a colony of mice preparing for a long winter. And then way down the line we have these two lonely dots. The lowest actually belongs to Dale Murphy, who gets a pass based on the fact that he embodied the 5 tool player of the 80s before his career production fell off a cliff due to debilitating arthritis in his left knee that basically turned it into a wet log. Gonzalez, on the other hand, stayed mostly consistent never reaching an extended stay down that valley. So what about this season made voters so head over heels that they were willing to throw whatever lessons they learned from last time into the trash? Boom, 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 boom. Oh. Boom, 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 boom. Don't get fooled, boom, boom, by eye-popping stats. Boom, boom, boom. Boom. Don't get fooled by eye popping boom. stats. Boom. 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 Just boom. don't do it. Just don't. Just don't get fooled by eye popping stats. Okay, that's the. It's the moral of the video. Bye.